A year and a half later and we're finally at the point where I'm remaking the video that got me noticed in the GTFO community in the first place. June 24th, 2020 was the day that I published my ultimate beginner's guide for GTFO. And today is the day that I make a new beginner's intro guide to GTFO to replace the old outdated one. Many things have changed since those days, but there's still a lot to teach in this game. So instead of doing hour-long videos like I did before, I'm going to make a new guide series where each video will talk about one or two specific topics in greater detail, and I'll continue to add to the series as future updates are released and more is added to the game. Over the past year and a half, I've been watching brand new players and taking notes on mechanics that they either struggled with a lot or just had a lot of questions about. And in today's video, I'll be going over these subjects, explaining them in a beginner-friendly way and simplistically talking about anything that I think new players should know about to ease them into the game. So let's start this party off with an appetizer by explaining what you can expect to learn in today's video before we get into the main course itself. Okay, so this video is just going to go over the basics of some early game mechanics, which means I won't be talking about literally everything in regard to set topics. I'll be leaving the more advanced stuff for a future video. I also want to make sure that this video will be as accurate as it can be even a few rundowns later, so I will be generalizing some of the things I talk about. But of course, if you have any questions about these subjects or anything else in regards to GTFO, Ask away in the comments and I'll get back to you as soon as I possibly can. As for today's topics, here's a list of everything that I'll be going over as well as timestamps for each section. So if there's only certain portions of this video that you're interested in, you can skip ahead to them. For everyone else though, we'll start off with what is GTFO and the goal of this game? So what is the story of GTFO? What is the point or goal of this game? Well, simply put, you are a prisoner who's being held captive in a gigantic underground facility that is overrun by a wide variety of creatures that want to bring your existence to an end. And the only reason you're still down here is because an entity known as the Warden is forcing you to go back down and complete whatever objective they give you. This game revolves around a system known as the Rundown System. Right now, at the time of making this video, we are in Rundown 6 and there are 10 levels that we get to play. After a few months have transpired and the devs finish it, Rundown 7 will be released, and Rundown 6 will be taken away, and we will no longer be able to play it. We'll only be able to play the new stuff that comes in with Rundown 7. And I can already hear some of you asking me, Scalar, does that mean once Rundown 7 comes out, I'll have to pay for the game again? And the answer is no. Once you buy the game, you have it for life. I purchased this game when Rundown 1 was a thing, back in 2019, and over the last two years, I have not spent an extra penny on this game whatsoever. There are no DLCs, there's no microtransaction, subscription fees, nothing like that. You buy the game once and you have every future rundown for free. Okay, that sounds pretty cool. So how do we go about actually completing the rundown? Well, every rundown will have a set amount of levels and every single one of these levels will have a main objective and some of them will also have a secondary objective and even a third objective known as extreme and overload objectives. And in the top right corner of the rundown screen, you'll be able to see four badges, and these signify those objectives. Main, Extreme, Overload, and finally, Prisoner Efficiency. Although you may notice I didn't say any levels have a Prisoner Efficiency objective. And that's because in order to get that badge, you have to play a level that has a Main, Extreme, and Overload objective, and complete all those objectives in one run of that level. In doing so successfully, you will be given a Prisoner Efficiency badge for the level, and you'll get a marker for it. If you want to 100% complete a rundown, you need to get every single one of those badges. And those badges are unique. You cannot just simply play the same level over and over again to get all of your badges. Starting a rundown off though, you'll notice that you do not have access to every single one of the levels. Levels will be locked and you'll have to do certain things to actually unlock those levels, which this changes from rundown to rundown, but there'll be something on the rundown page that'll give you an idea of what you need to do. Starting off, you usually only have the A tier levels unlocked. And since Rundown 6 only has one level, every new player will be beginning with R6A1. So let's go into the next subject of this video and talk about how you can find a group and get a game going. There are multiple different methods that you can use to find a group of people to play with in this game. The first one is using the in-game matchmaking system. 
All you have to do is press the matchmaking button. This will bring you to the matchmaking screen. You just put in a few parameters like what level you want to play, language, and a few other things. And then you just press the matchmaking button and the game will automatically put you into a lobby with other people. Although I have to warn you, this isn't really the best system to use in this game. The thing is a lot of people prefer to use the official GTFO Discord and just LFG there. So if you really want to find a group quickly, I would highly recommend you use the Discord instead. But if you're somebody who does not have Discord or you just don't want to use Discord, the in-game matchmaking system definitely does work. It just might take a little bit longer than you expect to. The other main method you can use is just simply hosting your own lobby and inviting people either by using Steam or inviting them by copying a lobby ID. In order to do this, you just have to click on the level you want to play, click on the button that says host lobby, and then you'll be brought into your lobby. And here you just click a plus sign and this is how you can invite people via Steam. You'll see your entire friend list, you just have to click and hold their name and it'll send them an invite. Or if you want to play with somebody who's not on your Steam friend list, all you have to do is go to the top right corner of the screen, there'll be a red button there that says copy lobby ID to your clipboard. Click that and then go to Skype, TeamSpeak, Discord, or whatever you use to talk with your friends and post the code there. Just either control V it or right click and paste. It'll have a long stream of numbers. All they have to do is just simply highlight that entire thing and copy it. And then they go in game, go to the rundown screen. And like you can see in the background footage, a red button should appear on the left side of the screen. And all you have to do is click that button and it will automatically bring you into that lobby. But let's say you are maybe a little bit of a shy type of person, or maybe you only want to play with your really close friends, but you still want to have a full group of four since this game is meant to be played with groups of four. What do you do? Well, there is an alternative for you, and that's simply by playing with bots, which on the surface might sound like a bad idea, but it actually does work out quite nicely in this game. The bot system is not completely perfect. There are some issues with it here and there, but for the most part, they do get the job done. All you have to do is just set the things so bots can play and they'll fill up the rest of the lobby of anybody who isn't in there. So if it's just you and one of your friends playing, you have two bots play with you, you can change the loadout freely, and then when you're good to go, you drop into the level. The bots will never be nearly as good as actual people because they can't think for their own or work on the fly, but you can give them commands using the in-game communication system, and for the most part, you almost have complete control over them. So if you do not want to matchmake with random people because you're shy or any other personal reason, you are able to play with the bots. And now that we've explained how to matchmake and actually get a lobby together, let's talk about the last thing you need to know before dropping into a level, and that's just simply how to pick your loadout. When it comes to your loadout, there's a bit to go over. Everybody on your team can choose their own primary gun, secondary gun, tool, melee weapon, and a few other things. When it comes to your primary gun, secondary gun, and your melee weapons, experiment. Have fun with it. Some guns are going to be better than others in situations. You know, if you have to kill enemies from afar, having shotguns on your team probably isn't a good idea. So I would definitely recommend have some variety across your team. Don't have all four people taking shotguns unless if you know that's actually super helpful in the level. And just experiment a bit. This game is difficult and having certain type of weapons for some situations would definitely make things easier. But overall, you can take just about any weapon combination into almost any of the levels and still be able to beat it as long as you know how to use that gun efficiently or the melee weapon efficiently. So mess around with them. They have short descriptions on them whenever you click on one. So just read those through, see which ones you think you might like and just experiment and have fun. Every time you go into a level, try a different gun, try a different melee weapon until you get a basic understanding of how every single one of them works. When it comes to your tools though, there's a bit more I want to say because these are very important and having the right tools for the job can make things a whole lot easier, especially for some of the more difficult levels. So I wanna give you a basic explanation as to how each of the tools work, starting off with the BioTracker. The BioTracker is sort of your informative recon tool. On the BioTracker, you have a radar and on this radar, if enemies are within range, they will appear either as small red dots or small white dots. If they are white dots, that means that they are asleep. They're not going to come after you or try to kill you unless if you wake them up or hurt them. If they are red dots though, that means they are actively trying to come after you and kill you. Or it means that it's a special type of enemy that naturally moves throughout the room a bit, although it's not fully alerted to your presence. Now, if an enemy appears as a red dot, you can hold the bio tracker out, hold down your left click while looking in the direction and it will charge it up. Once it fully charges up, it will tag those enemies and make a small red triangle appear above their head that everybody on your team can see. 
This can be very helpful in situations where either the room is very dark, maybe it's super foggy so it's hard to see enemies already, or if you're just in a situation where there's a moving enemy on the other side of that door because it's one of the special ones, you ping it in advance and you let your team know, hey, there's this type of enemy on the other side of that door, be a little bit careful when you go in there. Next up we have the Mind Deployer. This does basically what it sounds like. There will be a few mines stored into it. You can place them on almost any surface in the game. You just have to walk up to the surface with the biotracker and you'll see the little reticle. When it turns green, when you get close enough to that surface, you can place a trip mine down and you'll be able to see the red line coming out from it. This light sort of signifies its actual trip mine potential. So if an enemy runs through it, that'll trigger it and it'll blow up. But don't worry, if you run through it, it will not trigger it. Only enemies can set these off or if you, the player, shoots it. Be careful though because if you're standing next to a mine and an enemy goes to the tripwire and triggers it, it is going to blow up and instantly kill you, so be very cautious with it. Now mines you have to be a little bit strategic with because either you can blow up one enemy with this thing or you can blow up ten. A good way to kill a lot of enemies is use these on doors like you can see in the background footage. I see that there's a lot of enemies in the next room. So instead of me trying to stealth clear it, or in some situations when you can't stealth clear it, you can just go in, shoot to wake everything up, exit the door, shut it behind you, and place that mine down so while enemies are banging on the door trying to break it down, they're grouping up a bit, and once they finally do break down that door, they'll trigger that mine and most of them will blow up to it, and then you just have to deal with a few of the remaining leftovers. So mines can be very good, but you need to be strategic with where you place them. Next up we have the Seafoam Launcher. The Seafoam Launcher has two primary uses. The first one is to just simply freeze enemies in place. If you have a lot of enemies next to each other, maybe you can't stealth kill them effectively, or maybe it's a more powerful enemy, so you want to make sure that if somebody messes up their melee swing, it doesn't wake up and just backhand everybody, you can freeze in place, sort of like you see in the background footage. Doing this will make it so that the enemy will not be alerted to your presence. You can walk around, run, do pretty much whatever. As long as you don't shoot it or just damage it by meleeing it, that enemy will not wake up even after it breaks out of the sea foam. As long as you keep applying more and more, it will be trapped. But do keep in mind, some enemies stay trapped a little bit longer than others, while some can break out fairly quickly. The more common use of the sea foam launcher though is using it on a door, because doors have HP. When enemies are hitting it, they're depleting that HP, and when it depletes all the way, the door breaks open. The Seafoam Launcher is basically an overshield. When you apply it to a door, it will give it an overshield, which there's a limit to it. One full charge of Seafoam is basically that limit, but it will fully reinforce the door, and it will take enemies a whole lot longer to break it down. And as they're breaking it away and chipping the Seafoam off, you can actually shoot more onto it to continue to reinforce it. Theoretically, as long as you never run out of Seafoam, which is impossible, but if you can never run out of seafoam, you can make it so that enemies can never ever break down a door. Combine this with the mine deployer by playing seeing a mine on a door that's been seafoamed, and you can very easily blow up at least 15 enemies with just one mine, which is very good for you and your team. So use these two together because they have very good synergy. And finally we have the sentries. There are a few different types of sentries, and every few rundowns they'll take one out and replace it with a new one, so for the sake of keeping this guide universal, where even in future rundowns people can use it, I'm not going to talk about each sentry in particular, I'm just going to talk about them as a collective. When it comes to sentries, you can place them down onto basically any surface, either a horizontal flat surface or just the ground even if it's a little bit bumpy, as long as the reticle turns white. You place it down and it will deploy the sentry, and after a few seconds, it will start scanning in front of it. If it sees an enemy, either awake or asleep, it will lock onto it and then after a few seconds, depending on the sentry type, it will start shooting at it. This will wake up that enemy and obviously any enemy near it because it is pretty loud, but it can be very useful. I mentioned earlier that mines and seafoam could be a great way of dealing with a lot of enemies if you have doorways. But what if you don't have doors? What if you're just in wide open rooms? Well, that's where the sentries help out because they automatically target on the enemies, they're pretty accurate, and some of them are very, very powerful. So being able to have that extra firepower against enemies, even if you're in a wide open room, can be very helpful. That sentry will automatically shoot enemies and it will keep on shooting until there's nothing left for it to shoot at. So definitely bringing sentries with you can help out quite a bit in some levels. But how do you know the best combination of tools to bring into a level? Well, that honestly just comes down to personal experience. Learn each tool, experiment with them, figure out their strengths and weaknesses, and while you're playing a level you never played before, examine everything. Look at everything that's thrown at you and the challenges you have to face and think which tools would really help you out in this type of situation. And then if you fail that level and you have to go back into it, 
you can change your tool loadout and then think, okay, you know, the mine deployer wasn't really good because we didn't have many doors we can use it on. So maybe replace the mine deployer with a sentry and things might go a bit smoother. Keep on doing that and eventually you'll find really good tool combinations for levels and you'll get a better idea of how each tool works. Next up, we have boosters, which are basically buffs that you can apply to your character. There are three different types of boosters in the game. Muted, bold, and aggressive. Muted being the weakest and aggressive being the most powerful, although the more powerful it is, the more strings attached to it. You can equip one of each type of booster right before you drop down to a level, but every booster in the game has a limited amount of uses, which you can see when you click on the booster and examine it. When you drop down to a level, it doesn't matter whether or not you succeed or fail. Once that level is completed and you return to the lobby, that booster charge will be used and once it hits zero, the booster automatically gets deleted. There's no way to recharge your boosters. The only way you can get more of them is by finding artifacts in the game. There are muted, bold, and aggressive artifacts, and you can find them everywhere in every single one of the levels. You just have to keep an eye out for them. They might be on the floor, they might be on the wall, on a little bit of a shelf, or maybe they'll be in a box or a locker. When you find one, pick it up. Everybody on your team benefits from it when you pick one up, so it's not just simply first come first serve. And as you pick up more and more, you'll make more progress to unlocking another booster. It's not a currency type thing where you have to collect a certain amount to be able to trade them in. It's just simply as you pick them up, it'll make progress. Then there's some other things that actually influence how much progress is made. And once you make enough of it, you will be awarded the respective boosters once you finish the level. It doesn't matter if you succeed or you fail. Once you go back to the lobby, you will be awarded some boosters as compensation for your good works of collecting the artifacts for the warden. So experiment around with them. You don't need these to beat levels by any means. It's purely optional, but they can definitely help out. Just be careful because some boosters have conditions you need to fulfill in order for them to actually take place, and other boosters can actually have side effects to them that sort of off-put the benefits. So have fun, experiment, and see what crazy combinations you can come up with. And finally, there's your inventory, which is character customization. The more you play the game, you beat levels, you do optional objectives, and the further you get down to the complex, the more customization you unlock for you and your character. There's not really anything else I need to say about this, so I'm going to just drop it right there. Speaking of dropping, now that we finally have talked about what this game is, how you play it, how to find a group, and how to pick your loadouts, it's about time we actually drop down into a level and talk about some of the beginner mechanics that you should really know, that way you have an easier time getting into the game. Dropping down to a level for the first time, especially as a brand new player, can be a bit overwhelming because you don't know what to expect or what to do or how to even go about doing it. You'll be told what your main objective is on the way down and you'll have information in the top left of the screen to give you a little bit of a better clue as to how you can maybe go about doing it, but a lot of the time the game sort of just drops you into the deep end of the pool. Knowledge is key in this game. Knowing what a level is going to be like and what type of things you can expect along the way can help you come up with a game plan and fallback plans in case things go poorly. But as a brand new player, knowledge isn't something you really have a whole lot of. Thankfully though, there is something in every single level that you can use to help you gain knowledge of almost the entire level without going that far into it. And that would be the terminals. You can almost always find at least one terminal throughout every single zone in a level, which is quite helpful because you can gain a lot of information from terminals and you'll probably be spending a fair amount of time on them. There are many different commands you can use in terminals, but there are three in particular I want to go over. Query, List, and Ping. Let's say you know the exact name of an item, but you just don't know where it's located. For example, R6A1. Your main objective is to find the matter wave projector, but the game doesn't tell you where it is located. You know the name of that item and therefore you can query it. By querying that item, it will tell you which zone it's located in, so you know exactly where you need to go. Another example is a key card. Let's say you need a key card to open up a security door, but that key card can randomly spawn in one of three different zones. You don't want to waste your time and resources by opening up every single one of those zones, so instead, because you know the name of the key card, you query it and it will tell you exactly which zone it's located in. The next command you can use is the list command. Let's say you're getting hit quite a bit and you're low on health, so you want to see how many medipacks are left in the level. You can list a generic item like medipack, ammo pack, tool refill, or some other things, and it will tell you exactly how many are left in the level. It will also tell you the specific name of each of those packs, that way you can then query it to figure out exactly which zone it's located in, making your search a lot easier. Another way you can use the list command is by listing a specific zone. 
Let's say you just entered into zone 75 and you want to know how many resource packs or other key items are in here. You can list zone 75 and it will tell you everything. Doors, security doors, boxes, lockers, resource packs, and any other items that are important to grab. This can make it a lot easier to figure out if there's anything still left in a zone you're in or if you've cleaned it out almost completely. And then finally, we have the ping command. Let's say you know there's a medipack in the zone you're currently in, but you just can't seem to find it no matter what. As long as you know the specific name of that medipack, you can ping it. You can only ping items that are in the same zone as the terminal that you're currently in. So if you're in zone 75, you can only ping items in 75, not anything else. But when you ping that item, it will make a symbol as well as a sound effect emanate from that item that everybody on your team can see, making it a lot easier to find its exact location. But let's say you're in a really big zone and there are many different rooms and sort of a bit of a maze. The nice thing is, even though you might not be able to tell exactly where it is because the ping is super far away, the terminal will tell you the exact room that that item is located in, so you know which room you have to go to and your search will be a bit smaller. By using these three commands, you can figure out exactly where any item is in a level, where your resources are, and where you need to go to collect whatever you need. Speaking of resources, let's talk about those, because in some levels they can either be scarce, super scarce, or extremely scarce, and you're going to want to pick up as many as you can to increase your chances of survival. There are three core type of resource packs, medipacks, ammo packs, and tool refills, and these can only be located in those orange boxes and lockers you'll find throughout the levels. However, they're not the only things you can find in them. You can find other little goodies like lock mounters, glow sticks, explosive trip mines, seafoam grenades, artifacts, key cards, and so much more. So let your inner loot goblin out and open up every box and locker that you come across to see what's stored inside of it. However, be a little bit careful because not every single one of those can be opened for free. Some boxes and lockers will have padlocks or even hack locks on them. If it's a padlock, you're going to have to hit with fully charged melee hits to break it off. If it's a hack lock, you have to play a little mini game in order to open it up. But be careful when you do this. Smashing a padlock or failing at a hack lock will make noise, and if enemies are close enough to you, it will alert them and cause them to come after you and try to kill you. So if you see enemies next to hack locks or padlocks, make sure you deal with them first before you open up that box or locker to see what's inside of it. Now, I've already mentioned the existence of enemies a few times in this video, so how about I finally talk about the basic enemy mechanics that you need to know to start off. There are many different types of enemies in this game, and the further you get into it, the more powerful and dangerous they become. However, most enemies in this game have the same core basic principles, which is how they're alerted by your presence. Most enemies you find in the game will be just sleeping naturally. In this stage, they're not really doing anything. They just sit there on the floor or standing and they're completely still. They don't make any noise, they don't do anything. And this is the first stage of alertness. There are multiple things you can do though to alert them to your presence. Your flashlight being one of those. If you shine your light on an enemy, it will not immediately wake it up, but it will make it go from one stage of alertness to the next and it will keep on progressing until it fully wakes up. So make sure when you're near enemies, you either keep your light off or you make sure your light is not directly shining on top of enemies. Another thing you can do is sprinting. If you sprint near an enemy, you will immediately wake it up. So sprinting is a no-go when you're nearby enemies. Walking is okay, although it's a little bit more dangerous as it will cause enemies to progress from one stage of alertness to the next a bit faster. But crouch walking is the safest option because crouch walking will not cause enemies to go from the first stage of alertness to the second one. Although this does not mean crouch walking is perfectly safe, because enemies themselves can naturally go from stage 1 to stage 2. Stage 1 of alertness is just their sleeping phase. They're just sitting there, they're not moving, they're not glowing, they're not making any noise whatsoever. But stage 2 is when they start to move just a little bit and they glow a pinkish red color and make a little bit of a clicking noise. This is to tell you that they're sort of sensing you and trying to figure out exactly where you are and you need to cease all movement. If you shine your light on them or move even slightly, even if you're crouch walking, you will make them go into the third stage of alertness, which is the pulsing stage. This is where enemies will start to throb and gush and pulse quite a bit, and this is basically your final warning. If you move even a little bit more or shine your light on them again while they're in this stage, they will fully wake up and do one of two things. Either they will attack you, or they will scream and wake up every other enemy in the room with you, putting you in a bit of a nasty situation. So in a way, you're playing a big game of red light, green light. Crouch walk, keep your light off of them, and move when they're not glowing. But once they start turning pink and start glowing, you need to cease your movement until they stop when it's safe to move again. 
Now, of course, this can be a bit annoying, so you're going to want to deal with them, which you definitely can. Just not with your guns, because your guns are going to make a lot of noise and wake up everything near you. But your melee weapons are a lot more stealthy and are the better way to go. Melee weapons have different statistics, but a lot of the enemies that you'll see early on in the game can be killed by fully charged melee hits to their head. Enemies have damage multipliers. Hitting them in the front of the head or in the back near the spinal column will deal bonus damage, but if you hit them in the back of the head, you get both damage multipliers and you do your absolute maximum amount of damage. So if you want to make sure that enemy you're swinging at is going to die, aim for the back of the head. Most enemies early on in the game can just be killed by a simple full charge anywhere on the body, but a lot of the more difficult enemies that you'll face later have more HP, so you'll have to either aim for the back of the head, or you need to make sure that multiple of you are hitting it at the same time, as some of the really big powerful enemies you'll see later on require 3 or even 4 people to do fully charged melee hits to their back in order to stealthily kill them. So you're going to want to crouch walk your way up to enemies, be slow and patient, and make sure you don't move while they're glowing, and once you get close enough, you'll see that reticle in the middle of your screen gets smaller. This signifies that you are close enough to hit the enemy with your melee attack. However, be careful. You do not want to just simply start swinging the second you can, because enemies also have a detection radius. When enemies are in stage 1, so no glowing, completely still, the detection radius is at the smallest, so they'll only really detect enemies being killed if it's within a few feet of them. But if they glow even just a little bit, the detection radius increases by a pretty substantial amount, making it so that an enemy that's a bit further away can detect the enemy that you just killed. So when you get close enough to an enemy, make sure nothing nearby that you can directly see is glowing. If there's a lot of them, you can quickly shine your light on every single enemy to get them all to start throbbing a little bit without hard triggering them, and then when they all stop glowing around the same time, you go for the melee kill. Or your team can just work together and all four of you can go for an individual enemy to make sure there's a smaller chance of enemies waking up. And that's the basics of stealthing around enemies and dealing with them silently. Enemies aren't the only threat that you're going to have to worry about though in a level. There are also going to be the security doors. Whenever you go from one zone to another one that you have not been into before, you're going to have to unlock and open up a security door. And sometimes this is very simple and other times it's a bit complicated. Whenever you see a security door, walk up to it and read the text that appears when you look at it. This will give you an idea of what type of security door you need to do. If it says something like start security scan sequence, then you're fine because that's just a freebie door, you just have to activate it, a full team scan will appear, and when you finish that full team scan, you'll be able to open up the door and head right on in. But in most other situations, there will be an alarm tied to that security door. And there are many different type of alarms in this game, but most of them work very similar to each other. When you initiate the door, it will make a full team scan appear that you and your team will have to finish, and then sets of smaller red scans or big red scans will then go out. You only need one person per red scan, but having more people in it will make it go by a little bit faster. And you will have to keep on standing in these scans until they disappear, and doing that over and over again until you complete every single set of scans, and you get a message at the top of your screen saying that the door has been unlocked. However, while this is happening, an alarm is going off, and this alarm is causing enemies to spawn in and come after you from two rooms away. It's always two rooms, so they will never spawn in the room you're in, they will never spawn one room away from you, only two rooms away from you, unless if there is no room that's two rooms away from you that they can possibly spawn in. But this doesn't happen too often. So before you do an alarm door, open up the map, look at where enemies can spawn from, and then set up your mines, your seafoam, and your sentries how you see best. That way they help defend you, and you can focus on the scans instead of trying to kill the gigantic wave of enemies that's coming after you. Once you finish every single set of scan and you get the unlocked door message, the alarm will shut off and the only enemies you have to deal with are the ones that are still alive. Once they're all dead, the bow music will turn off, it'll go back to the regular ambiance, and you'll be able to safely open up that security door and head into the next zone. And for the most part, that's really all there is to the basics of a level. Going in, collecting resources, using terminals to figure out where you need to go and where things are located, stealthily dealing with enemies, going through security doors, dealing with alarm doors, and just progressing through it until you get to the point where you're where you need to be to complete the main objective. But what happens when you finish the main objective? Do you just automatically get teleported out? Well, no, that's actually not the case. When you finish the main objective, an extraction scan will appear, and it will either appear in the room that you initially dropped into the level from, or it will appear in an area known as a forward extraction, in which case you'll have to go through some new zones to get to that point. All you need to do is get at least one person into the extraction scan in order for it to gain progress. 
However, this can be a little bit more difficult than that sounds because if it's a Ford extraction, obviously you have to go into areas you haven't been to yet to actually get there. Or in other situations where maybe you just have to go to the next room over, you might have to deal with what's known as an extraction alarm. When you finish the main objective, an extraction alarm can initiate, which will just infinitely spawn in enemies until you either all die or until you get the scan to 100% and you exit the level. The extraction alarm can also initiate when you actually step foot into the extraction scan, so you won't know for certain if there's an extraction alarm until you actually step into the scan and wait a few seconds to see if some music starts playing. Not every level has an extraction alarm, but a fair amount of them do. So you will have to do a little bit of final defending on the extraction scan before you fully escape. Extraction scans can also take a variable amount of time to complete, so sometimes it'll be very quick and other times you'll be there for a little while. But once you get the scan up to 100%, you'll be teleported out of the level and you have completed the level that you just went into and your expedition is over. And that's everything for today's video. And I have to say, I think compared to the first beginner's guide I did back in 2020, I did a solid job with this one. After all, it's almost half the length of the previous one. <laughs> but I guess the ultimate judge on how good or bad this video is are you, the viewers. So let me know if you liked or disliked this video by using those special buttons down below. If you want to go further than that, you can also leave a comment on the video. Like I said earlier, if you have any questions for me in regards to today's topics or anything else GTF related, ask away and I'll get back to you as soon as I possibly can. And not to just shamelessly plug, but I do have my own Discord that you can join to become part of the community I'm building, and there you can ask me whatever you feel like asking me and maybe even potentially get the chance to play some rounds with me. So if that interests you, you can find a link to it down in the description. I'll be doing more guides like this one in the near future that go over mechanics in far greater detail, so if you have something that you'd like me to talk more about, let me know. I have a few ideas on the future guide videos, but I can definitely add to that list quite a bit. So thank you everyone for watching today's video, I hope you found it useful, and hopefully it'll help you get started on your journey into GTFO. Until next time, have fun exploring the complex, both those of you who are old or new players, and I'll see you all in the next video.